Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to look at the 12 volt head end and battery selection. The heart of any off-grid power system is the battery bank and the first thing you need to establish is how big it needs to be. The starting point for this is to list all the things that use electricity fridge, heater, lights, and then how long you'd normally use them in a 24 hour period. Fridge is on for 24 hours, lights might be used for 4 hours in the evening, the heater might be on full power for a couple of hours, but likely to go down to a lower setting for the majority of the time, let's say 8 hours. You'll want to charge your phone of course, and maybe run your laptop for a bit. And if you're on a boat at anchor, your depth sounder and GPS should be kept on with an anchor alarm set, and you'd need to show an all round white light during the hours of darkness. Once you've listed everything, you then need to investigate how much power each item uses, so it's time to get out the instruction manuals. Power is measured in watts, however battery capacity is measured in amp hours, so you need to establish how many amps you need over the length of time you intend to spend without charging your batteries. Not every instruction manual will give you a clear figure, but every appliance you have will say how many watts or amps it uses, and if your system is going to be 12 volts, then it's simple algebra to fill in whichever gaps you end up with. Watts equals volts times amps, or amps equals watts divided by volts. In the case of a battery bank on a small boat, that would be 12 volts. Once the research and maths is done, you should end up with a completed table that looks something like this. Now on its own, this shows the usage for 24 hours. If you think you need to have capacity to run for 2 or 3 days without charging your batteries, then you'll have to double or triple your capacity. But for the type of sailing I do, 24 hours without charging is about right, and as you can see my usage is around 190 amp hours. I'm going to add a solar panel, so that should give me at least some charge, and obviously these are worst case scenario numbers. If we were to install a wood burner, we wouldn't use the diesel heater as much, and in summer we probably wouldn't use heating at all. Plus at a pinch we could be more frugal with our power usage, for instance turning the fridge off overnight will save a few watts, and if your food's already cold it'll usually stay that way until you get up in the morning. A quick readjustment of our table for frugal usage, and you can see a realistic reduction of around 50%. So I need a capacity of 200 amp hours. What batteries should I buy? Now there are so many videos on the benefits of the different types of battery on YouTube, I'm not going to go too deep on this subject. There's obviously a cost argument with basic lead acid being the cheapest and lithium ferrophosphate being the most expensive, but there's also the fact that if you regularly discharge lead acid or AGM batteries below 50% depth of discharge, they won't last very long. Gel batteries fare much better, but are not cheap, and still offer only around a thousand charge cycles before they need replacing. Lithium, on the other hand, can happily be discharged completely without damage, and are offering over 3000 charge cycles, so over the lifetime of your lithiums, you would have had to change out your AGMs two or three times. Lithiums are lighter as well, and charge quicker than most of the traditional types, but the most important factor is that lithium is the future of battery technology. I expect that when I need to replace my boat batteries next time round, lithium will have come down in price so much that the AGM and gel types will be pretty much obsolete. Suffice to say, I decided to go for the eco-worthy LIFE PO4 12 volt lithium ion phosphate battery. So even though these are the least expensive batteries uh, that I could find, um, this still represents £700 as of uh, June 2023 um, for two batteries. Um, well, that's a significant investment of anybody's money. So what do we get uh, for the £700? We get the box, uh, we get two battery terminals, and a little instruction manual which is of some uh, relevance. You can physically see, uh, when it's compared next to this uh, lead acid battery, there's a size difference. That's about 60 amp hours, that's 100. So it's physically smaller, and it's a heck of a lot lighter. So I haven't decided what kind of batteries we're going to have. Um, one of the things we're going to do is put them physically in place. And in this particular layout, there's a battery box there and a battery box there. And whilst I would really like them to be next to each other, the amount of, uh, let's say, it's a, it'll be a lot simpler just to leave these battery boxes in. Although they'll need some modification, they don't appear to have any method of strapping the batteries down. 
so we'll have to put something in for that but in general these battery boxes that have, that have been put in here are actually quite adequate <laughs> So I think you can see there's a lot of movement in that. So we need to strap that down later. But that'll be okay. For now, for, while we're still out of the water and we're not ready to launch, that'll be good enough in there. Now the batteries are in, we need to plan the wiring and work out what needs to be attached to the system. Obviously, the first pair of wires are to connect the two batteries together in parallel, giving us 200 amp hours at 12 volts. Next, we're going to add an automatic bilge pump. This is connected directly to the battery bank, so that if we start to take on water when we're not on board and the boat's turned off, the bilge pump will still have power. We need to monitor the amount of electricity we're using, and also how much power we have left in the battery bank, so next up is a battery meter. This uses a device called a shunt, which is on the negative side of the system, and like the bilge pump, it's permanently wired onto the batteries. Our first method of charging the domestic bank is using a solar panel, and the control box for that also needs to be connected directly to the batteries. Everything else we need to be able to turn off when we're not on board. This is to prevent power drain and reduce the chance of a fire caused by an electrical fault, so we use an isolator switch that feeds into a primary fuse board. Our second method of putting power into the battery bank is using a mains powered charger. This one's an inverter charger, so it also takes power back out of the domestic bank and converts it up to mains voltage for the 230 volt sockets we have around the boat. But because this is just a 12 volt schematic, let's ditch the mains at this stage to avoid any confusion with the drawing. The third and final method of charging comes from the boat's main engine. We don't use our domestic bank for starting the engine, we have a separate starter battery for that purpose. And that one gets charged by the engine alternator just like it does in your car. But once the starter battery has been charged up, we might as well use the alternator to put some charge into the domestic bank. So we have this battery to battery charger to do that job. Well that's the battery management sorted out, now we just need to add all the circuits which is done via two fuse boards, one in the electrical cupboard and to reduce the overall length of wiring another one over by the helm station. And the final thing is the anchor windlass and its associated control box. So a distinct challenge uh, with all this 12 volt head end wiring um, is that the, the actual lug size, the, the ring size that goes on the terminals um, we've got several different sizes. So as an example, uh, the battery isolator has 10 mils, whereas the bus bar has 8 mils. The battery terminals uh, are, I think, 8. They might even be 6. And the, um, the ones on the inverter charger here, they are 6. You know, for, I've, I've got the right cable diameter for the lug. What I don't have is I don't always have the right terminal. So I now had to sort of start the job and then have a little pause whilst I went away and ordered uh, a whole range of different lug sizes. Um, so I kind of had to work it all out, which uh, right, I need one of those to that side and that, that, that and got it through. So I've now got a, a big pile of um, the different lug types, uh, hopefully with some spares in case I make errors. And now I've got to do all that, all the short bits, and then we can finish that wiring of the main part of the head end. Pretty sure we're all familiar with these type of crimping tools, which are uh, for these standard size um, automotive crimps. But that's not really man enough when you're talking about the sort of cables that we're doing. So these, this is a, uh, a 25 mil, which if you compare it next to that yellow one, that's the difference in, in the cable size there. And we've actually got some 50s that we're doing as well which is even bigger. So we need something a little bit more manly, a little bit stronger, and this hydraulic crimping tool is just the ticket for these size of crimps. Start by selecting the correct size of crimp for the job that we're gonna do. So there's a little bit of play in that one you see there. And then you add the blocks the tool. So we're going to take this 25mm cable and we're going to put this 25 by 6 So the first thing we need to do, establish a length 
which I think we can safely say is there. And I'm just going to go a little bit less than that. Get that off. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a little elastic band around the neck of this. And what I'm doing that for is so that I can then slide this right up there. So it's around there. And then we should be in a place where we can very easily just push that into there, which we can. And then cut away the elastic band bit. Okay, and then what we do is we start to squeeze. And then we release the hydraulic bit. And it comes away. And there you've got a nicely crimped terminal. So I'll take some heat shrink. Bring in the heat gun. finished article so extreme care must be taken when uh, handling these cables we're going to wire one end up which means the other wire end if we'll put that one in the onto the stud uh, and then that one will be live and if it wanders about and accidentally for instance, touches that bl that black wire there and if that black wire is live we might have a spark or it might just accidentally get pulled onto a piece of metal on the boat somewhere and then it might short out on something else. So dangerous this, this process. Once they're in, they're very, very safe because they're only 12 volts. But getting them in can be an absolute nightmare. So we're going to plug that end onto the bar and then we're going to put the tape around this one to prevent it accidentally touching anything. And onto there, like that. So I'll just put that in as a little testing fuse. There then followed several days of cutting and stripping and crimping, making up all the cables and wiring everything up. But after a while, we started to get to the finishing stage with the main isolator installed, the mains cables in conduit to isolate them from the 12 volts DC, and everything tie wrapped and tidied up. So this head end cupboard uh, is almost completed. Um, we've got the fuse boards in, we've got wiring in, and we've got one of the sub boards including uh, the Wi-Fi, uh, the bilge pump, uh, the secondary bilge pump and the water pump uh, as well as obviously that's the controller for the, uh, for, for, the um, for the inverter and then we've got actual mains as well from the either from the inverter or from shore, shore power. I hope you've enjoyed the video please like and subscribe and thanks for watching.